Hi, everybody. Uh, I see people in the um, room, but I can't see anybody. So I'm going to assume that uh, people are here. Um, otherwise, it will end up being an hour of me talking to myself. Uh, so if at all possible, um, can someone put into the chat, hi, we're here and we can see and hear you, just so I have some confidence in technology, if at all possible. Hey, there we go. All right. Well, at least one person is going to listen. Um, perfect. Look at that. Well, this is exciting. Uh, we are um, we are live. And so really happy to be with everybody today. Um, I want it to be as interactive as possible. I want it to be a real life account into um, what life looks like as a sport physio. Um, how to become a sport physio is a, a huge goal of today. Um, so then hopefully you leave today feeling equipped with what that life looks like, uh, should you want to embark on it. And so I'm really happy to be with everybody today because essentially becoming a sport physio is ultimately um, what drove me to become a physio period, let alone uh, a sport physio. Um, and so and the reason being, and this, you know, I, I had a, a fairly easy time to navigate my career in terms of what I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, for the reason being that I was inspired by sports as a huge sports fan myself. And so I became, uh, or I was, slash M, but less so, uh, a huge Maple Leafs fan. And I knew their roster from top to bottom. I knew their, uh, you know, management. I knew their training staff from top to bottom. And ultimately, I wanted to be the guy standing behind the bench with the gloves, being able to help, you know, at those days, Gary Roberts or Curtis Joseph, you know, should they get hurt. And that is off, or what prompted me to figure out how I could be that guy with the gloves so I could work with that athlete and be part of that environment and be part of, you know, what I thought would have been a winning culture within the Maple Leafs organization. Turns out it's good that I don't work for them because otherwise it would have been a long drought of disappointment uh, up until this point. But ultimately, um, I, I felt quite fulfilled in the, the world of sport physio. Um, Hopefully by the end of today, you realize perhaps it's not as glamorous as it looks. You know, it looks very cool to be that guy with the gloves behind the bench. But in reality, you know, I want to paint a picture as to uh, essentially what it looks like, you know, um, with travel and what it looks like with sacrifice with family and that kind of thing. Uh, but hopefully by the end, you feel that the reward outweighs the you know the downside of it all uh and just like anything you're you've you're on placement and you're getting a, a real life sense of what a life as a physiotherapist looks like and you know this is one specialty of sport that hopefully you have a bit more clarity uh, about at the end of today so let me just make sure um i've admitted everybody before we get started here looks to be we have a pretty good sized group here. I recognize one name, so that's exciting. The rest, nice to meet you uh, and hope to get to know you, you know, more and more uh, as we go. Um, so here we go. <clears throat> Here's a, a bit of an agenda. Uh, so I think that it's important for you to get to know me, not, you know, so I can brag about what I've done, but so then you have perspective into what my perspective is. Um, and so then you can ask questions about how I might have gotten to this point uh, based off of, you know, uh, my past. Uh, then I think it's important to define what a sport physio is and how it's different than an orthopedic physio or how it's different than what you would see in private practice. Then a big part of becoming a, a sport physio is uh, the Sport Physio Canada credentialing process. And it's ever evolving, just like the orthopedic division is with their AIM system. And uh, it's evolving for the better, very much so. Uh, it's far more formalized now than it was before. They now have this really nice curriculum, uh, which before they did not, they had you know, 15 or 20 textbooks that you had to read and know in order to challenge an exam. And otherwise they could have drawn any question from those 20 textbooks. And now it's very much uh, essentially uh, getting a sense of, um, sorry, somebody hopped in the, the waiting room here. 
Um, otherwise, it is now essentially uh, a formalized curriculum that now we can benefit from uh, because there's far more structure to what they teach and as a result, what you are to be examined on. Now, uh, then it's important to say, hey, this is what a sport physio is, and this is uh, essentially a day in the life. Um, then it's important as part of that to appreciate what rewards and challenges are while working with sport. And then at the end, kind of give you one example of how you can get involved with sport as part of a fellowship process, which is very kind of mentorship focused and kind of equips you with the skills to be successful in sport. So I keep exiting this only because I keep hearing uh, things happen here and it's an otherwise a different screen. So. I apologize. Perfect. All right, so <clears throat> a little bit about me. Like I said, my name is Craig Dixon. Uh, I am uh, working at the University of Guelph quite intimately with their athletics program. Uh, where it all started was at Western. Um, I think this is a pretty Mac heavy or Mac centric uh, audience today. And so you might you know, uh, be booing behind your webcam currently uh, by the fact that I went to Western for Ken. During that experience, I knew already that I wanted to become a physio before I, I, uh, I even applied to kinesiology. And in that took a lot of courses that set me up to become a trainer for the Western uh, varsity program. And by doing that in my fourth year, I got a very keen sense of uh, what I wanted, uh, well, essentially it reassured the fact that uh, I want to become a sport physio um, by the fact that I just loved it. And it was awesome and fantastic and beautiful in every single way. Which then, you know, uh, knowing that that's what I wanted to do, you know, the next step was uh, physio and I uh, went to Mac for physio. A lot of you are McMaster, you know, uh, students and so I don't need to go into a whole lot of uh, in-depth you know uh, testimony as to what that was like but set me up for success knowing that sport can be a bit of a, a dumpster fire in the sense that uh, you jump into an environment that is quite unfamiliar and that uh, is very unpredictable and you have to be able to react uh, very fast uh, and react in um, a safe manner, basically. And what I felt, you know, McMaster's program being very problem based learning and um, really equips you with the skills to problem solve uh, and try to rationalize and clinically reason. Uh, I, I felt that it helped to prepare me for sport, knowing that, you know, no two injuries look the same and some are very benign, you know, an ankle sprain and some are very um, scary. Yeah, and uh, being able to navigate that uh, continuum is uh, in part thanks to McMaster. I owe a lot of my uh, experience and confidence within sport thanks to the, the U of G sport physio. And how it ended up working was um, I was in my first clinical lab at McMaster and uh, the instructor, one of them uh, was the manager of uh, the physio department at the University of Guelph by the names of Brett Lyons. And he still works here, he's just on a leave. He decided to uh, leave to New Zealand to live and work there for a year. And so having got to know him quite well and having to get familiar with the uh, fellowship at Fowler Kennedy, I had reached out to Brett and said, we should do this at Guelph. And uh, essentially that is the birth of the fellowship that I will talk about later on today. He had mentioned how that had been a goal of his for a while to create a fellowship at Guelph. And uh, luckily I was the catalyst making the suggestion at the right time, we made it happen. And it has evolved ever since, you know, we're now seven or eight years in the making. And uh, every year is very different because the, the beautiful piece to it is that it evolves as the people that go through the program evolve based off of their loves and interests and skill set and passions and all that stuff. 
And so we built this uh, sport fellowship to what it is now and uh, something that I'm quite proud of. And, you know, at the end, we'll be recruiting for it. And I hope that, you know, one or two or more uh, are interested. And uh, you also are proud of by the legacy that you leave in that fellowship, knowing that you can mold it uh, for the and pass the baton off to the next person. From there, luckily, I became a registered physio. And then I became or kind of followed my teaching journey, uh, both collaborating at McMaster, uh, then teaching at the University of Guelph, uh, focused on anatomy and biomechanics uh, quite a bit. And then once Brett, uh, you know, took his leave, I've kind of stepped into that director role here at the, the University of Guelph. And uh, we've since built a team that is um, fantastic and awesome. And I'm really happy about uh, the people I work with and what they contribute to uh, life in Guelph and beyond. So my sport experience, um, quite heavy on the varsity side, as you can imagine, having um, worked at the university for seven, eight years now and uh, worked with a, a bunch of teams, uh, men's rugby being the, the mainstay and having worked there with them for uh, five years. Previous to that, it was track and field men's hockey. Uh, now starting to work more with men's baseball, women's lacrosse. And so, you know, the longer that you're in a university setting, but it's inevitable uh, until you essentially work with every team. And uh, yeah, there's no, I'm, I'm never fearful of getting bored for the fact that I can work with one of a thousand different teams at any given point based off of, you know, where, where things are needed as well as perhaps what uh, sport is you know my favorite for that given season i also had the uh, privilege to work with a professional basketball team guelph nighthawks um, as their head physio as well and so that gives a lot of perspective into what life looks like uh, from a, a professional standpoint when um, you know athletes are coming and going on contracts and you know more so that the business and politics of what sport looks like. Uh, done a lot of tournament uh, coverage and, you know, later on in the talk, you're going to get a sense that um, how you can get your feet wet with sport without a massive commitment. And while you build up your toolkit and confidence in sport, event coverage and tournament coverage is a beautiful way to do that because you can maintain a sport medicine or orthopedic caseload and otherwise venture and donate weekends here and there to kind of build up your repertoire, both of skill set and build up your hours to be able to challenge these four credentials as part of SBC. And so part of that, uh, again, a lot of varsity uh, rugby championships, soccer championships, uh, working with Golf Canada as well for a tournament. And there's never a shortage of tournament coverage. Um, you will see that on SBC, they have tournament coverage for the World Badminton Championship for junior tennis, you know, uh, tournament, at, you know, as part of Rogers Cup or whatever it may be. And uh, as you build your resume, you can essentially climb the ladder based off of, you know, what you had done previously to that. Uh, I've also consulted with Soccer Canada uh, and SBC. So with Soccer Canada, <clears throat> I had the privilege of treating one of the uh, players for the men's uh, national team uh, this past summer um, who ended up going and playing in the World Cup, which was very cool. And uh, it happened quite organically um, where, you know, just like everything in, in the world of physio or healthcare, you know, you kind of, um, it's all about essentially networking. And uh, the, the men's national team reached out to me um, hoping that I could help with uh, one of their athletes, both based off of geography and expertise. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, probably in part due to sport experience, probably in part due to clinical experience, probably in part due to teaching experience. And so, um, yeah, essentially my advice to you is to say yes to things. And uh, then you end up kind of crossing paths with people that end up referring, you know, someone who's going to the World Cup, which is quite neat. Um, I'm quite familiar with the SPC uh, for the fact that I worked with the SPC for four or five years, uh, something like that, both as a, um, a student representative in school and then sitting on the Ontario executive. And so 
quite familiar uh, with how the process works in terms of the credentialing process. At that point, when I was sitting on them, we were talking about how uh, we could develop the curriculum to make it mirror a bit more like what the orthopedic levels are. And it's now very neat to see them having done it since I've moved on from that role. And so it is, uh, it's really, really neat. And I'm proud of the work that SBC does. All right. So I imagine I, I threw in a lot of obnoxious uh, videos in the background just because they're cool. Um, and probably on your end, they are freezing your computer and it's probably distorting my voice. But even despite that, I think it's worth it. <laughs> so enjoy this distracting video in the background. So sport physio, uh, as you can imagine, assists active Canadians of all ages and levels uh, with a bunch of different uh, injuries and uh, conditions, both to encourage them to return to sport and to maximize performance. What I often find as part of physio as a, a profession is that, and both as you know, a, a point of emphasis of the patients we treat, is just getting people pain free. What's nice once you start working in high level sport is that um, the focus shifts beyond that. Certainly if you have an athlete unavailable to play, that's a problem. And you know, we end up throwing away tissue healing times. And you can, you know, you've all been witness to that when you uh, hear how someone, you know, well, a uh, good example is O'Reilly breaking his finger and he's available, I guess, at the four week mark, which is, you know, long before bone healing time. But thanks to, in part, an amazing medical team that surrounds him, as well as the pressures of sport and the business of sport, you know, uh, you know, tissue healing times get thrown out a little bit. But another part of our point of emphasis for sport physios is not just to get them pain free but to also maximize performance and see how we can get the most out of athletes, um, which is a really cool difference between sport physio and orthopedics in a lot of ways. Um, I practice both uh, in the setting that I do, but it's cool to work with uh, an athlete and contrast that with, um, you know, a quote unquote, you know, active individual, but that has very different goals. And the difference being is that you can essentially take someone through a continuum of care from injury, well, really injury prevention, injury, um, rehab, and then phase that into strength and conditioning. And following someone, someone all the way through there is wildly rewarding. And as a physio is wildly challenging because too often in physio school, we learn how to do clamshells and we learn how to do single leg balance and we learn how to do a sit to stand transfer. But in reality, that stuff doesn't really apply to most athletes where we have to now be challenged to look beyond that. We have to essentially whip out what we would do in the gym um, or whip out strength and conditioning textbooks uh, to essentially try to service the high level needs of the athlete. Because, you know, we're equipped uh, with exercise prescription skills of people on the far other end of the functional capacity spectrum. And it's really cool to be able to fill that gap between what you learned in school with someone, you know, um, older individual or uh, post catastrophic injury to someone who tore their ACL and now is you know, two weeks out from returning to play and making sure that you challenge them in a way that will mimic what the demands of their sport will be. And it's very cool uh, to be able to do that and has a lot of creative freedom with that, which is very cool. Um, and so, yeah, that, there's a very different or big difference between orthopedics and sport physio, at least for how I define it. By the way, I want you to think of all your questions um, based off of, you know, the platform. It probably doesn't allow for me to switch screens very easily to answer questions as we go. So you're welcome to populate the uh, chat room um, and then that way you don't forget any questions as well as. Uh, um, and then we essentially have an itinerary of what to talk about. 
uh, or you can write it separately and then we can come back to uh, it and you can raise your hand and unmute yourself or we can answer questions out of the chat box. So fill it up um, so then we can make sure that uh, you get the information you need to make a decision as to whether sport physio is for you. So to be a sport physio, uh, you need to have completed a diploma in sport physio through SPC. So not everyone can be sport physios, only people who are uh, credentialed and have gone through the certificate level and then moved on to di uh, diploma level are technically sport physios. Anybody can work with sports, but if you wanna call yourself a sport physio, just like if you wanna call yourself an FCAM, you have to have had uh, that training and kind of formal recognition of your skill set. As you know, Sport Physio has a credentialing system that allows members to progress their knowledge and skills through mentoring courses and written and practical exams, just like what we see in other specialties of physio. So, how are uh, Sport Physios and the skills that they possess different than? let's say orthopedics, which will also treat ankle sprains, for example. The big, big piece is the on-field emergency care. Uh, as part of the current entry to practice curriculum within physio, uh, there is no on-field emergency care. If uh, you're working and standing on the sidelines of a high school football game and someone goes down, physios as a whole are not equipped to deal with that. Sport physios, that's a huge part of the curriculum uh, and a huge part of the examination process. And so on-field emergency care is something that you have to fine tune and really is what separates a sport physio from an orthopedic physio who is standing on the sideline of sport. Organization of medical and paramedical event coverage. So uh, there's less part of that in the curriculum, but uh, being able to organize an integrated support team is uh, a big part of uh, that collaborative sport physio process. When we are now standing shoulder to shoulder with a sport physician, shoulder to shoulder with an athletic therapist uh, and more so. Taping is another thing. Um, I know that when I went to McMaster, we had maybe three hours of taping um, as part of school. Um, a lot of taping was learned as part of placement, but really athletic taping is different than clinic taping and uh, that you learn, uh, you know, mentoring side by side with a sport physio or as part of uh, the uh, essentially prep for the exam process. <laughs> sport massage, uh, functional testing to return and sport decision making, protective equipment, analysis, fit and maintenance, protective bracing, Exercise phys, strength and conditioning, clinical management of acute and uh, chronic sport injuries, preseason screening, development of programs for injury prevention, concussion detection and management, all big parts of what a sport physio would do. And, uh, you know, what separates them from other specialties of physiotherapy. Another obnoxious graphic in the background, because why not? What conditions would you treat? Fractures, wounds, concussion, ligament sprains, muscle strains, dislocations, performance, and more. So really, what we treat uh, is very similar to what an outpatient community orthopedic practice would treat. Difference being is the setting for one. Um, you know, instead of being within the comforts of a clinic, you are standing in the cold uh, in November in a snowbank on the sideline of rugby pitch. <clears throat> what also is different is the acuity of the injuries. So instead of an orthopedic physio treating a fracture six weeks after the, uh, after the injury and they come out of uh, a cast, a sport physio, at least field side, would be treating or attending to that fracture um, five minutes after they have fractured it and they will be splinting it and maybe calling at 911 and uh, slinging it and then transferring them. And then in six weeks would see them for uh, rehab after that. So the setting is very different. You know, instead of a clinic, you are 
trying to slip on the ice. Well, not trying to slip on the ice. You're trying to stay upright on uh, ice while you run across it during a hockey game, um, as well as the acuity where things happen and it's essentially injury day zero when you see them at least as part of the field of play. And then you get to follow them from that moment all the way through their rehab journey in a lot of cases. Versus orthopedics, you see them once someone else has assessed them and referred them to physio. Both are fantastic. Depends on how acute and fresh things you want to uh, deal with. Because when things are really fresh, it's kind of stressful, right? And some people, you know, uh, chose physio over athletic therapy for the fact that uh, they want instead to uh, treat, you know, in a calmer, more controlled environment than in a chaotic sport environment, which for some, they love that. And I do, and it's awesome, um, but it can be overwhelming. And so depends on what your cup of tea is. Where would you work? Well, you would work in a sport medicine center, whether it be an outpatient community or as part of a university sport medicine center within orthopedic clinics. So a lot of uh, uh, sport physios will have essentially a full-time orthopedic caseload and then will essentially do sports stuff on the side, whether it be as part of uh, a team or whether it be to volunteer or work uh, as part of a, a tournament. Um, but it's quite varied and they do it, you know, but otherwise what pays the bills is an orthopedic uh, physio practice. Field side is where you will work. So, you know, court side or uh, pitch side or rink side, you know, whatever side, depending on what your interest is in sport, your expertise in sport, um, you can do whether it be, be on a um, single one-on-one -on -one basis, you know, essentially, or a one-off basis of you covering a game or a tournament, or whether it be you are in the trenches with that team, uh, working with them every step of the way. Or you can be quite high level and consulting with, you know, Soccer Canada or Hockey Canada or the Olympic, International Olympic Committee, and you are sitting on some sort of committee, which is uh, changing the policy for those who are um, working, you know, alongside the athletes specifically. But otherwise, you're kind of thinking more high level or you're consulting on a case by case basis, depending on, you know, you're a tendon expert and you have, uh, you know, Basketball Canada sending you Steve Nash to work on his Achilles for example. All right, can't skip over this graphic. Nope, it's either frozen. Oh, no, nope. here we go. There we go. So I'll take a pause here for a second. Um, any questions up until this point? So up until this point, we uh, talked about my background and I'm happy to talk about myself. That's never been an issue for me. Uh, we've talked about what sport physios are. We've talked about what the settings that they work in. Um, and then next, we're going to talk about how to become a formal sport physio. Uh, but up until this point, I'm curious if we have questions. All right. So I have a question for Mackenzie. So thank you for your question. Uh, what was your experience like on a professional team and how did that compare to a varsity team? Great question. Fantastic question. Um, so. Or so a varsity team is quite uh, established for one. Um, so. And has a lot of players at whose full time job is to organize things behind the scenes. So whether it be, you know, with regards to travel or, uh, you know, uh, sport nutrition for the athletes or mental health support for the athletes or academic support for the athletes. You know, you come in and you're one piece to a giant puzzle. Um, and uh, it's quite nice because you can stay in your lane and um, really focus on what you are good at, for example, which is you come in, you are working um, field side for rugby and your job is to, if someone were to go down uh, to attend to their issue. 
and then you know follow up with them in clinic and see them through and uh very rewarding you're dealing with a student athlete who is both smart and athletically you know uh capable and it's really cool to kind of see them navigate through life especially during a part of their life which is quite formative being a university uh, aged athlete um so very cool you're also working in a team of uh you know physio athletic therapists and then within clinic you have access to everybody on the team should you need to refer so sport medicine, uh, orthopedic surgery, if you had to, massage therapy, chiropractic, uh, sport nutrition, dietitian, naturopath, all the, the weapons uh, that you can access, you know, to refer out as well. Um, the demands of varsity athletes or varsity athletics, um, while diverse, is perhaps less demanding than a professional athlete would be. You know, your whole identity is not being an athlete. Uh, you are, you know, part time athlete, part time student, part time friend, daughter, you know, everything else. And while it seems like there's a lot riding at the varsity athlete level, um, it's not someone's job. Uh, and therefore, their whole livelihood isn't, uh, and whole identity isn't wrapped up in being an athlete like a professional athlete would be. And so with that comes a lot more pressure, uh, both from the athlete to you and both with respect to the organization to you when you're dealing with a, a sport or a professional sport. Plus, contrasting that to varsity athletics, you wear a lot more hats. Depending on how professional you're talking about, whether it is a uh, you know, CFL versus NFL or, you know, Guelph Not Nighthawks versus NBA, you are um, often having to be the athletic therapist, the sport physio, the massage therapist, the, you know, team psychologist, you know, everything wrapped up in one and essentially having to coordinate a lot of things behind the scenes as well. Uh, so it's very different. The mentality is very different. The stakes are very different, um, equally rewarding, just different. And uh, you also have a lot more creative freedom, I found, with professional sport uh, than you do uh, within a giant, you know, um, institution like a university, where essentially, if I wanted to do preseason screen, <coughs> excuse me, that I uh, had you know need a wall testing or doing a, a t test for agility um, and found evidence to support it i would go to the team president and pitch this and say hey we should do this to monitor you know for uh, injury detection or for trying to get some sort of objective metric to then be able to apply uh, for performance optimization in collaboration with uh, strength and conditioning and essentially, if I can um, articulate it as to why it will make the team better, uh, I can make it happen. Versus with uh, a university, we are uh, having to deal with a lot more players involved, you know, um, you know, stakeholders, I should say. Uh, so, you know, there's less flexibility as to, you know, how I can imprint onto this uh, team. Uh, just because there's so many people also imprinting uh, on the team. And so both very cool, but very different. So Mackenzie, that was about a 13 minute answer. Uh, so do I, uh, you know, send a, a follow up if uh, there's a specific, you know, niche that you, you were curious about. In the meantime, I will answer Kevin's. Uh, does a typical game day for sport physio mainly consist of taping and responding to acute injuries? Um, so uh, it depends on the sport, for one. Um, some sports require, you know, everyone needs to have tape for them to be able to uh, be mentally ready to play. Others, uh, you know, find that tape will curse them, you know. And so depending on the sport, it will very much dictate what the pregame routine looks like. It will either be taping or it will be sports massage or it will be, um, essentially you helping to facilitate a warm up program that will essentially get them you know primed and ready to go 
or it's you let the athletes get in the right mindset. They will have their big beats headphones on, ignoring the world. And your job is to stand there and just be available should they need you. And so essentially for the pregame piece, very different depending on uh, the athletes that you see, depending on the sport, depending on the time of year. You know, I will be far less busy in the beginning of the year and far more busy right before playoffs when everyone's banged up. And then during the game, uh, yes, it's mostly responding to acute injuries. It is mostly, uh, if not all, essentially me waiting for people to get hurt and me attending to people once they do get hurt. Uh, and then essentially activating their the, the team's emergency action plan should we need to. Uh, or, you know, communicating with the coach saying, hey, this guy is limited, but uh, still available. And so a lot of communication goes behind the scenes for that. Uh, Kevin, let me know if there's any follow ups with that. Uh, K, uh, don't know what K stands for, but K, uh, does the sport physio lead the professional team in injury prevention exercises pre and post game? Uh, most often, yes. Um, unless they have a, a strength and conditioning uh, coach, but in reality, even the strength and conditioning coach uh, won't attend games uh, very often. And so therefore, um, it tends to be the people who are going to be at that game available for injuries leading that uh, pre and post game routine. And it's quite a fun routine, to be honest, at least from my perspective, because it requires you to go look at the research to see how you can with your homogenous group of pro basketball players or pro volleyball players or whatever what the research suggests is being best for optimizing excuse me performance or preventing injury so yes i uh, support physio often um how about areas of overlap for example, you mentioned the sport physio creating the warm up. Would this be done in collaboration with the coach or SNC? Yes, it would. Yes, it should. Uh, typically, the coach wants to delegate as much as possible off their plate, and they recognize that you and strength and conditioning uh, far exceed their um, knowledge with respect to pregame stuff. And so uh, it will. Um, they will say, hey, we have 10 minutes, uh, you go out and do your thing. And uh, whether that be with collaboration, strength and conditioning, if the team has it, if not, then you are doing it, uh, or you sit down with s &C and create a plan that you will often uh, execute. RuPaul, does that seem fair? Ultimately, a lot of this, how many hats you wear is dependent on how, um, deep the roster is with respect to the integrated support team. Essentially, the, the makeup of professionals that will uh, service the team. And uh, it's both fun and intimidating to wear hats that you are not trained to wear, right? Physios, while we should be exercise experts, um, are not. You know, strength and conditioning are better at exercise prescription than physios are, at least for performance. And uh, but when there isn't strength and conditioning, you need to figure it out and figure it out quick. Um, but luckily, skills that you are equipped with, such as research skills, uh, provide you with the confidence to be able to go out and do that and feel pretty good about it. All right. Any other questions before we hop into? The, the next part of this. I love these questions, by the way. So don't be hesitant. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, I would much rather this be a dialogue and uh, for you to, you know, get some sort of insight rather than a didactic lecture. Because I recognize that you have been sitting in lecture for eight hours already and would probably rather have a conversation than me just being a talking head on the corner of a Teams meeting. So fire away. Otherwise, um, I will await for your um, notification. All right, next up, how to become a sport physio. This is the continuum, which is available on Sport Physio Canada website. So you do not need to memorize this. You do not need to write this down. 
what you need to begin with, which is ultimately uh, what you should focus on now, is uh, essentially uh, becoming an SPC member and it's free to do as a student. So there's no reason and no financial barrier to you participating. So when you do your annual registration, you would ask to be part of the Sport Physio Canada membership. Then you need a Sport First Responder, or at least a First Responder certificate in order to find a mentor and to be able to uh, begin uh, collecting hours, basically. And so I highly recommend becoming a sport first responder and SBC has sport first responder courses that run quite infrequently, uh, maybe once a year, uh, maybe twice a year, but once could, you know, one once is geographically co convenient and the other you would have to drive, you know, eight hours for. And uh, become a sport uh, first responder for the reason that uh, the skills are far more applicable than uh, a general first responder is. For example, sport first responder, you will practice collaring and boarding an athlete with a helmet on. With first responder, you learn how to board an athlete or board a, a civilian. And so there's a lot of nuances to dealing with helmets, a lot of nuances dealing with equipment, how to access certain parts of the body with equipment, how to cut it off, how to take off face uh, mask with uh, uh, a tool for a football player that you need to do CPR on. And a lot of the stuff you won't have to see, but is uh, a good nonetheless to have experience specific in sport. Then you will find a mentor and then you will begin collecting hours and you will sign up for this new course, a fundamentals course for certificate level. And then, uh, you know, complete that, go through the written uh, process and then have your sport cert. So this is my mentor actually. And uh, this is not a solicitation for you to find Ali on LinkedIn and to bug her to become your mentor. Uh, I'm sure she sh would say yes to everybody who asked because she's the world's nicest person. But I did want to, uh, you know, highlight the the need to have a good mentor in your corner uh, to be able to both prep for these exams as well as to, you know, text when you have a, a difficult scenario and to get reassurance whether you handled it right. So uh, SBC, I believe, I should know this, I believe has a list of mentors who have put their name up and said, I am happy to help. And uh, you'd be able to find it that way. Or ideally you work at a, a sport medicine clinic who has mentors there who can assist you through this process and be able to sign off on your hours. Next is collecting field experience hours. So uh, as part of this process, you will have to collect, uh, I think it's 200 hours with 75, per, uh, 75 hours being contact sport hours. So you will have to pick your uh, sports according to uh, making sure that you are getting a diversity across non-contact and contact sport. So how you do that is totally up to you. It's dependent on the connections that you have uh, within sport, whether it be in the community or beyond, uh, and uh, also depends on your geography. For me, it doesn't make sense for me to work with the Toronto Maple Leafs and commute to Toronto every time uh, or every day. And so my access to certain teams is uh, different than um, if I were to work in Markham, for example. Uh, but, you know, uh, also the opportunities that you get will pull you uh, into certain markets where sport is greatest if this is a passion of yours. If you have no connections local to your community, then uh, answering SPC job postings for field coverage is a great way because you know that team is uh, looking. And so fantastic way to say, hey, I like tennis. There's a tennis tournament ha happening this weekend. I want to do that tournament and get experience. Then you would take those hours that you would jot down in the log 
and have your mentor sign off on them uh, in preparation for the exam. So one option is to find your own teams and how you can find your own teams is by you know, cold calling your old high school wrestling coach and say, hey, I'm a physio now. Wahoo, uh, I will want to volunteer and help out and essentially uh, support your team. Alternatively, you can work at a facility that already has predetermined or pre-established uh, connections with sport. So one being a university. The beautiful part about a university is that you have an all-you-can-eat buffet of sport. You know, at any point, like I mentioned, I could work with squash or I could work with football or I could work with hockey or I could work with baseball uh, and that could change season by season if I wanted to. Or you can work with uh, a clinic who um, is in the community and has contracts or connections with local sports teams. Uh, you know, an example would be HBC, you know, certainly we have access to all the university, but we also have access to Guelph Nighthawks. They sought us out because of the reputation of the clinic, or uh, we work with a, a semi-pro soccer club called, or we used to, uh, Guelph United. And so, you know, you can have access through the uh, clinic that you work at that, uh, you know, the surgeon is the surgeon for the Toronto Blue Jays and therefore you have access to that population. Or you make the first move first. So like I said, answering a job posting or cold calling uh, a team is another great uh, option. And ultimately that's what ended up me here. Like I said, I reached out to uh, the manager of the clinic and said, I want to work there because I think working at a university is cool. I want to work with sport and universities have lots of sport and I want to do that through a fellowship. Then uh, we created a job and made that happen. And if you get nothing else other than from this talk, other than the confidence to cold call and make your destiny come true, uh, do that. I remember being in your position probably around this time of my second year, you know, it was uh, March or April, and I was looking up the email addresses to the president of all the OHL teams that I could find online and sending them an email and saying, hey, I want to work with uh, your team. And I had no, you know, reason to i had no experience to and certainly i was under equipped to service them should they have said yes but believe it or not i got uh, a call back uh to interview with the uh miss saga steelheads an ohl team i got uh, a call to meet with the president of the hamilton bulldogs and although i did, did not deserve the job nor did i get the job but uh you know if you just show your passion and say I want to work in sport. This is the sport I want to work at. Uh, and then just, you know, politely and professionally harass. You can at least get in front of uh, a group or a single person who has decision making power. And, uh, you know, perhaps that's your first introduction to sport. I probably wouldn't recommend doing that in a lot of cases, just because you probably, if you want to work with the Toronto Maple Leafs, want to have a good foundation of experience and skill set to succeed in that role. But there's no reason why you can't cold call a high school or local team or, you know, the equivalent of Guelph Royals, which is a pro uh, baseball team in town and see what comes of it. It might be an internship. It might be an assistant physio. Uh, and then you learn the ropes and then you take that experience and cold call, you know, one level up uh, from wherever you were at. So uh, do that and uh, you'd be surprised, while it's uncomfortable, you'd be surprised with uh, what results you can get out of it. Or you can climb the ladder. You can cold call, you know, uh, a midget hockey team, a single A midget hockey team, and then that turns into uh, a double A and then a triple A and then a junior D and junior C. And then before you know it, 10 years later, you're uh, working with the Toronto Marlies. And uh, it tends to, 
what I've learned from sport is that it tends to be the result of the networking you do. And a lot of that networking is predicated on how good of a job you do and how good of a job you do is based off the experience that came before you. And so soak up every level of sports and your goal doesn't need to be to go to the Olympics. A lot of people's are, but you don't need to. You could just get fulfillment from working in sport, gen, uh, period. But if your goal is to climb a ladder and to reach a certain level within sport, give it your all for every single one because you know coaches become references within sport. Uh, players become references in sport. Uh, and, you know, all of those experiences, how you handle a particular injury might impress the GM who then, you know, sends you to the next level. And so climbing the ladder is both as a result of the, the work you do, as well as the people you know. And that is uh, both a great part of sport, but also an unfortunate reality of sport where it's so tied to networking, which is great if you like to network. It's unfortunate if you don't. But hopefully from this talk and you knowing this early on, you have uh, that insight to then be able to come at sport for, uh, through a slightly different lens. So there's now a course as part of this sports cert that essentially by the end of it gives you everything you need to know to challenge the exam, which is fantastic. And these are the different uh, units within it that before you had to read 20 different textbooks on each of these topics, and now they have uh, experts in each of these areas who will uh, talk about it, which is awesome. Here are the exams. Uh, so there's a written and a practical, and uh, registration is dependent on uh, whether you've had all the prerequisites up until that point, as well as, which I just learned today actually from a colleague of mine who was going through the process, um, that you need two years experience. And so uh, to challenge the exam, <coughs> excuse me. So you don't need two years experience to get start moving your way through the, the curriculum and through this kind of continuum, but you do need it by the end. And so essentially you can budget two years in advance to uh, work with these four teams who will get you the amount of hours that you need and the experience to be able to challenge the exam. So keep that in mind. I could be wrong on that. I was overhearing, uh, but look into it. This is the diploma level, so we won't go through it, but Basically, it's an advanced version of certificate level. So, any questions uh, thus far about navigating the process uh, or something that you would have forgotten about uh, in the previous section? And while you do that, I'm going to clear my eye because of my eyes water. Just so darn passionate about this. Fire away. Anything? All right. Wait, I understand you could be typing right now um, or you're asleep or you have already uh, tuned out because you know <laughs> from me having spoken that you do not want to be a sport physio. Uh, and that's OK. Um, ultimately. Uh, it's good to know what you want just as much as it is to know what you don't want. So a day in the life of sport physio, and this is a, a real world example. Um, and it's, it's not the, the flashiest day, but it is a, a day in the life. So uh, it is, uh, when was it? A Friday night, uh, boarding a plane to Edmonton uh, with the basketball team. And uh, it involves leaving the, uh, the arena from where we gathered at 3 p.m driving to Hamilton actually to get on a plane uh, at 6 p.m. and fly to Edmonton. And uh, upon landing, the we learned that the coach had been fired. This is professional sport uh, at its finest. The coach had been fired while, while we were in the air and they had already uh, flown a new coach to Edmonton um, 
in order to get oriented to the team and uh, coach the, the game that was then on Saturday. So we land, it's now 10 or 11 at night, and uh, here I am in the bedroom of the uh, coach coach's uh, hotel room, in addition to two assistant coaches, um, and that might have been it. It was me with all of the training staff, and then maybe team manager as well. And here we are getting to know the new coach who in 18 hours was going to coach the game and ideally turn the team around. And so meeting goes two hours, uh, me giving a, a lowdown on every player, me giving a lowdown on the abilities of each player, me uh, identifying weaknesses in their game based off of you know injury that they had been working through. And that meeting goes until midnight. Uh, then, you know, I hadn't had dinner yet. So here I am walking through the streets of Edmonton, trying to find food because my stomach is about to shrivel up and I'm about to die. And uh, nothing is open at midnight in Edmonton. And here I was uh, in a 7-Eleven uh, having dinner. Long story short, I almost got stabbed, I think, uh, by the locals. And luckily, my team members, you know, seven foot basketball players also had the same idea at midnight and, uh, you know, got me out of trouble because otherwise the locals were circling me like fresh meat. And so escorted back to the hotel, go to bed, wake up the next day at uh, whatever time and begin treating from 10 a.m. until game day or until game time. So what that typically looks like is uh, you with a, a travel massage bed um, or on the end of uh, a bed or at the on the floor of a hotel room, depending on what uh, you brought with you and what the host team uh, supplies you in the, the hotel. And you do that until about three. And then essentially it's you go to the uh, um, arena to do a pregame and then you come back and then you go out for dinner as a team and then you go to the uh, arena for a 7 p.m. tip off. And then you do two hours of a game. You <laughs> excuse me. You come home and you treat for you already come back to the hotel. You treat for an hour or two. Go to bed. You wake up the next morning and fly home. And the it's a, a cool life, a cool lifestyle. It's a wild lifestyle. And ultimately, it's still mind boggling to me to this day that uh, all of that, me being gone for three days, is all for a two hour game. You know, uh, leaving Friday and coming home Sunday to play two hours on a Saturday night. And lots happen. You know, you're doing uh, pre-game, pre-practice routines, post-practice routines, pre-game routines, post-practice routines, and then treating uh, around those times as well. And if you have an opportunity, if no one essentially reaches out looking to connect, then you are, you know, wandering the streets of Edmonton, uh, you know, for a, an hour or two before uh, that being available again for the players. So it's uh, it's unique, you know, that story is, you know, uh, replicated many times over through the course of the season. And it's cool to see different parts of the country, um, but do know that it comes with a sacrifice of being away from family. Um, but ultimately it is rewarded by the fact that you can hopefully raise a, you know, a trophy at the end of the year and say that you're a part of that, which is quite special. So the reward of it, uh, you know, I, I hope you don't go into it for uh, the credibility piece of it, but that undoubtedly, if you see a surgeon who uh, works with the Toronto Maple Leafs, you automatically assume that they're better than the next guy who didn't. And while it's true, or it's just that they're a better networker uh, than the last guy, it uh, certainly gives you a different level of experience that um, you can then hang your hat on and say, hey, I'm, I'm at least good at this one little thing. Part of that is uh, um, multi multidisciplinary collaboration. 
So depending on the team that you work with, at the level that you work at, um, you will, as you climb the ranks, work with more and more professionals that uh, will essentially operate within a smaller and smaller scope of practice to support that team. And that is very cool because then, you know, when you come out of that team setting, your scope of practice has expanded a little bit thanks to the knowledge that <coughs> excuse me, your teammates, you know, your uh, integrated support teammates have provided you. Big part is training and skill acquisition. So what I mean by that is if you are uh, before a season of a contact sport, you will, or at least you should, be practicing how to collar and board athletes. Um, and even those with 30 years of experience will uh, be practicing that at the beginning of every season. And it's thanks to that practice where should something happen, you can respond to it. And we saw that in the example of DeMar Hamlin, Hamlin who uh, had the heart attack for the Buffalo Bills or his, a cardiac arrest during the Buffalo Bills game. And thanks to that constant training of doing CPR and that emergency action plan, those that healthcare team saved his life. And it uh, goes through all levels of sport, at least from you know semi-professional on, where a big part of their job is to stay sharp, which I love because I love you know the challenge of you know both skill acquisition and maintenance of skill. Um, you know, in I, one of our previous sport medicine docs is uh, one of the high ups within the International Olympic Committee. In fact, the highest doctor within the International Olympic Committee. And she, I was, I met with her last week. And she said that uh, her job is to create chain, training plans for the doctors to be able to attend to, you know, coloring and boarding for every different venue. And these doctors are the best of the best, uh, and yet they are being trained every single year as if they know nothing uh, to practice, practice, practice. And it's a very cool thing. Uh, Plus, being able to collaborate will then, you know, expand your scope. It's cool being a part of a team. Um, both uh, an integrated support team and uh, the, you know, athletes itself. The change of pace is cool. You know, it's cool to, um, you know, the monotony of a clinic can be, you know, repetitive at times, you know, clocking at nine, you know, clocking at a five, charting until six, and otherwise rinsing and repeating that for 30 years. There's a change of environment. There's a change of pace where you go from doing nothing to attending to a, a serious injury. And that is quite cool if that's what you're, if that aligns with your personality. It is really cool to win. You know, when you win a game, despite you having not burned a single calorie to uh, sink that basket or score that goal, you feel like you've been part of that. And that is uh, wildly cool and rewarding. Uh, if you like to see different parts of the country or the continent or the world, uh, being part of uh, a team affords you the ability to travel, which is uh, which is quite neat. As you can see, travel is also a downside. You know, because it does come with giving up your life to travel for three days for a two hour game. And that is both awesome and, uh, you know, breaks my soul a little bit to think of the, the sacrifice of time for a small unit of reward. Weather, you know, you didn't think that was going to be on the list. You know, um, if you have played uh, or been a part of a team, a rugby team, for example, uh, you know, at least at the varsity level, they compete until mid-November, late November, and you have to stand there and be cold while everyone else gets to run around the field and stay warm. You are freezing your butt off. And it is fun because that is also part of the change of pace, but uh, it's cold and you get wet and, you know, uh, all of that. A lot of sport is evenings and weekends. So you have to be comfortable giving up your evenings and weekends to support teams. 
professional athletes are, you know, competing evenings and weekends. I use sport, go to school, and then they compete evenings and weekends. And for you to be part of that, you have to realize that there are um, inconsistencies in hours uh, that, uh, you know, comes at a cost. Sport can be political. There's a lot of egos, whether it be from the athletes or whether it be from other members of the integrated support team who is trying to step on you to climb the ladder. Um, and the politics, you know, everyone wants to be the person that, you know, was the reason why Kobe Bryant was Kobe Bryant. And they're all fighting to be the guy or girl that, you know, was the reason for his or her success. And uh, it can get messy sometimes. Don't be intimidated by that. At least you recognize that and you can then find teams uh, or be part of culture changes of teams where that is an issue. But do know that it's a highly competitive environment and everyone is trying to keep, keep their job, both, you know, coaching staff is uh, one loss away from losing. And when they lose, sometimes team president cleans house and starts fresh. And that's the reality of sport. And, you know, whether you had any reason to be cleaned out as part of that cleansing process, you know, you can be thrown out just like everybody else. And so everyone is trying to be trying to show value for why they should stick around and be part of the, the next dynasty, for example. Networking, you know, can be tiring, especially if you don't know how to do it. And uh, ultimately, it's a reality of sport. And so um, comes with its challenges. Compensation. Um, sport physios don't get paid well, um, typically. You know, uh, part of that is because there's a million people applying to be the sport physio for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And so why do they need to pay you a lot? when you know they could just pay the next person to do the same job um, as well as you know even if you're working for uh, rugby Canada or for hockey Canada these are non-for-profit organizations that uh, might not have a lot of funding for their sport team or the team that you're working with isn't prioritizing uh, physio instead they're investing in uh, uh, athletes uh, or instead investing in facilities uh, because they don't know that the value of uh, what we do. So uh, don't expect to be rich working with sport. Uh, if you want to be rich, then maybe stay in orthopedics and dabble in sport as a hobby. But uh, even full time sport physios uh, aren't in it for the money. Heartbreak, you know, uh, the last slide winning is great, but losing is sucky and so you go on this roller coaster with the team uh riding the highest of highs and the lowest of lows then uh you know if you have a practice it gets disrupted quite a bit uh both work and life as you are coming in and out uh and so that can have an impact on your caseload and that can have an impact on home and all of that stuff just because you are at the mercy of uh the team schedule all right, so how can we get more involved? Before we go there, what questions do we have about day in the life? Ooh, nice, we got a couple. So can you briefly describe the difference between, oh, here we go, sorry, I have to scroll back. Were you an athlete? Uh, yeah, well, sort of. Uh, I was an athlete and I grew up playing sports and I learned around high school that despite my dream, to become uh, the next Curtis Joseph, who was a starting goalie for the Toronto Maple Leafs. I wasn't good enough to become the starting goalie of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And so part of my rationale for pursuing uh, sport physio was to be in that environment, knowing that you know uh, I wasn't gonna be a professional athlete. And so I've maintained you know sport as part of my life uh, and you know, supporting teams is uh wildly rewarding um you know similarly rewarding to you lifting the the trophy up as an athlete yourself you don't burn as many calories so you have to work out despite having been to a game for two hours um 
And uh, yes, so coming at sports with your own athletic experience is a massive advantage because you can speak the language with the athletes that you uh, collaborate with. You can uh, sell to the coach that you know what you're talking about because you know, you know, uh, the biomechanics of a rowing stroke because you competed in high school. And so therefore you can speak the language of sculling and sweeping and uh, what forces are being applied in which areas and knowing that there's natural asymmetries that happen with that given sport, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, often we will pursue sports that we have our own experience playing because we know the equipment, we know the uh, procedure, the rules, the politics, the levels, all of that that uh, can help you um, try to uh, navigate the environment. Other great question. Uh, could you briefly describe the difference between certificate and diploma? So, uh, Certificate is more foundational skills. Diploma is more advanced skills. At the end of the day, the certificate can provide you with the skills to be confident working in sport. The credibility more so comes from the diploma piece of it. So essentially it's level one and two type of thing with certificate and diploma. Uh, certain events and sports and tournaments will recruit based off of whether you have certificate or diploma. And so they will often say, SPC will often say, uh, if you have certificate, you can apply for national events. So Canada Games, Ontario Games, that kind of thing. If you have diploma, you can apply for international games, Pan Am Games, Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games. And some of their job postings will say you need a certificate minimum or will say that you need a, a diploma. Ultimately, and SBC won't be happy about this, is that I have worked within sport without my sport diploma uh, because a lot of it is predicated on networking. But if I wanted to work with uh, an Olympic team that I was not already associated with, I likely wouldn't get it knowing that I don't have a diploma. However, if I was working with, you know, Canoe and Kayak Canada, and I was their sport physio and has been for the last five years, and they go to the Olympics in 2024 or whenever the summer games are, I would likely be able to go despite not having a diploma. And that's because I am their team rostered uh, sport physio. And the Olympics doesn't care that I don't have that. But uh, if I was applying to be part of this massive pool, they want some standardization process to say, if you have a diploma, okay, we can guarantee that you have this skill set. So the difference being is essentially certificate, you learn foundation, diploma, you learn more. And there's also a difference in terms of what you can apply to when there's these open casting calls of um, a, an event coverage for Pan Am Games, uh, for example, and you're just one name in a pool of 100 and they're trying to decipher uh, your skill set across or in, in comparison to other people's. Kevin, I hope that helped. Uh, Mackenzie said, as a sport physio, how do you go uh, about building and developing relationships with athletes and staff? Have you experienced a conflict with a coach or an athlete where they did not agree with your recommendations? What steps did you take to navigate this? So I love that question. It sounds like an interview question. And uh, ultimately, if I were interviewing any one of you or anybody else, that might be a, a textbook question I might use. So I might copy and paste that, but I already have it because that's exactly what we ask. So um, first part is how do you develop uh, relationships? Um, the most effective way, I believe, is having a genuine, honest uh, passion for the team to do well. And you're in it just as much the coach is in it, just as much as the athletes in it. And when that's genuine, people can see that and people are gravitated towards that and appreciate your contributions because you're not doing it to, you know, put it in your clinic bio that you work with the Blue Jays. You're doing it because you love baseball so much and you want Jose Bautista to hit more home runs 
and that you know comes across. So that's how you, I think you develop relationships or how you build upon pre-existing relationships. How do you get in front of the people to uh, you know develop that relationship? How do you get onto the staff of the Blue Jays? Well, you do that by essentially working your way up through the minor leagues and showing that passion all the way through, showing your skill set all the way through, show your ability to collaborate and to become better all the way through. And then that becomes quite evident quite uh, quickly to people and people appreciate that more than ever. Um, have you experienced conflict? Yes. Um, Physios like to pull athletes because of risk management and liability and, you know, uh, because we care about their future health and their future ability to uh, participate in sport. And so when an athlete sustains a concussion, we are quick to pull them. Athletes don't like that. So that creates conflict. Uh, ath our coaches don't like that because then they lose their star player from being able to uh, participate. And so a lot of that conflict can be avoided at the beginning of the season to define roles within the team to say, I, you know, who gets the last call here? That last call for medical related stuff needs to be me and you need to have my back when I make that call. Because when we don't, I lose trust or uh, the, the athletes lose trust in me and we're establishing uh, unnecessary conflict. And so a lot of it can be avoided, but ultimately the heat of the uh, game and the environment and the stakes of that game uh, can lead to uh, tempers and lead to uh, confrontation. And uh, that's the reality of sport, just because everybody wants to win. And some people want to win at all costs. And your job as part of that healthcare team is to mitigate that risk so it's not at all cost. Um, it's all at reasonable cost, if that makes any sense. So yeah, it happens and it happens more than it should. But uh, you know, you you have to have uh, the expectation of that happening doesn't then lead to a surprise when it does happen. So you asking that question will, when it does happen, you know, be like, oh, I remember that time. Yes, that, this is normal, and that's comforting. How competitive is the Guelph Fellowship, and what are some benefits versus other programs? Great question, Jason. That is part. Three of this, the last part here. So hang tight and we will talk about it. So how you can become more involved in sport. So to save you from having to find your own connections and find your own teams, you can pair up with a, a university or a sport medicine clinic who already works with sport and within a team who has lots of experience working with sport. And having being part of that uh, leads to a lot of mentorship and a lot of uh, opportunities that you would otherwise have difficulty breaking into um, knowing, again, a lot of this is predicated on networking. So here we are. Uh, University of Guelph provides a, a sport and orthopedic physio fellowship at the University of Guelph which is in part supported by Hermosa Physio Associates, which is the clinic that, or the, the, the company that holds the contract for physio services at University of Guelph, where we essentially create this one year or nine month-ish uh, training program to develop you to become uh, the next best sport physio. So what's it look like? First, where is it? So this is the Health and Performance Center. I'm in one conference room within the Health and Performance Center, which is quite nice, quite fancy, overlooking the gym and across from the uh, rink, if you're familiar. And uh, we were built in uh, 2018, at least the new facility was. Multi-million dollar renovation with this just being a couple uh, pictures of what the clinic looks like. So we have, you know, countless team members that you're going to see on the next page here, uh, and a massive space where it is essentially 50% uh, beds, which you can't really see here, and 50% gym, which is wildly cool because uh, too often, 
you know, a clinic's gym is between two treatment plants, as opposed to having turf and, you know, equipment out the wazoo that uh, otherwise is available to actually be able to run people and stress them in a way that uh, challenges their functional capacity. So very neat. So the HPC itself is 20, 25 years in the making uh, with uh, the last four years, us being in this brand new space uh, with the rest of this building that I will highlight called the JT Powell building, which is where this room is. Uh, all of this being all the other aspects of student wellness. So along this wall, we have uh, counseling services. In the bottom here, we have uh, our uh, walk-in clinic essentially so we have a bunch of family doctors a bunch of nurses up on the second floor is where the health and performance center is way over here is where student accessibility services is and so everybody is under one roof uh to be able to kind of access each other should we have uh, a student or community member need it our team uh, there's eight physios uh with the hopes of adding two sport fellows next year uh, and uh, potentially more positions as well. Um, our physio department is very intertwined with athletics, and currently athletics is molding a new model to support athletes where physios are becoming more and more and more and more involved within the varsity program. And so within the next year, within the next two years, three years, uh, we will likely uh, see a massive increase in the uh, number of team members. And so with that, uh, we have lots of opportunities for growth, both for the fellows, uh, as well as those fellows maybe then transitioning into full-time permanent roles, uh, given that uh, there's this big kind of push for physios to become more and more involved within uh, athletics. How that looks is ever evolving and we're currently managing that, but ultimately uh, what we know for certain for this coming fall is that we're looking for two uh, sport physio fellows, uh, which is uh, more than what we've had in the past. For six years, we had one. Uh, this year we increased it to two and athletics has really appreciated our work in the department and wants to uh, strongly root uh, physio within athletics as uh, a department. Outside of uh, eight physios, three sport medicine physicians, one orthopedic surgeon, sports psychiatrist, four ATs, three chiros, two massage, one naturopath, one podorthos, one sport dietitian. And so we all get together on a monthly basis to collaborate and talk about uh, a particular item and uh, so you can see we have a lot of experience to, to pull from with it probably, you know, increasing by 20 or 30 percent in terms of how big the team is within the, the next couple of years, just because we're seeing unprecedented growth currently. So what's the fellowship work with or what's it look like? Essentially, half the time is uh, working. Uh, well, I should say, how did I put this? 50% of the time is in clinic treating students, faculty, community athletes, essentially uh, typically a young, active, healthy population that uh, often compete in sport, which is quite nice. About 30% is treating varsity athletes. So you will be working with a team and uh, servicing the athletes within that team, or you will be working with multiple teams and servicing those athletes. Uh, again, variety of non-contact to contact. Uh, you'll be working field coverage. Uh, and so, you know, in the sleet, in the rain, courtside, and, you know, uh, athletes going down and you're the one with the fanny pack and the gloves on running out to service those. You deal with that acute injury, you bring it back to clinic and you make them better available for the next week to uh, be able to compete. Then 10% is other. So we talked about how every year this fellowship uh, molds and evolves, and a lot of it is based off of the interests and ambition of the fellows that we have in that position. And so if you like teaching, uh, I teach anatomy at Guelph. Uh, and so you're more than welcome to hang out with me in the cadaver lab to um, to be essentially serve as a TA of mine in uh, anatomy. You can shadow sport physicians and learn from them. You can uh, collaborate. We, we have many, many uh, connections on campus to 
whether it be spine biomechanics or anatomy or physiology or neurophysiology. And, you know, based off of your interests uh, in research, you can collaborate with those faculty and uh, help them and help you at the same time. And so essentially it ends up being an August to April thing where really uh, once you get your provisional license is when it would start formally. Before that, you would be uh, still part of the uh, system working with training camps and otherwise but not being able to be a physio until you got your provisional license. Uh, so it ends up being nine ish or eight and a half months with the opportunity to be hired after uh, should the clinic be in a position of growth to be able to uh, take you on after that. And given the current climate, you know, my hope is that we can hire every fit, uh, fellow that uh, graduates the program. And historically, in seven years of the program, we have provided offers to every single fellow that has uh, gone through the program. Whether they want to stay in Guelph or can stay in Guelph uh, is a different question, uh, but uh, you know they most end up working hereafter, which essentially has led to the, the growth that we have seen within the, the clinic. And so the goal is not for you to um, you know, leave after nine months. Hopefully we create such a, a diverse and profound learning experience for you that you want to stay. And hopefully uh, you have contributed to the growth of the clinic to also be able to stay. And that's a really uh, cool part of the experience. So like you saw, part of it is working with varsity athletes, uh, both field side and a clinic. Part of it is working in HPC, treating faculty, staff, uh, community members, uh, elite sport uh, or elite athletes and community and otherwise uh, within the walls of the HBC. Big part is mentorship, whether it be for the sport physio or for the orthopedic mentorship, but in either case, you will leave being a better physio than you came. Big part is on field, knowing that sport physio uh, is uh, not a big part of the curriculum within uh, entry uh, to practice programs, uh, that's the big area that we need to tune up and develop. And so we put a lot of time and intention doing that. You can collect hours. You'll be working with contact and non contact teams, and therefore you will be able to collect uh, SBC mentorship hours. You'll be able to teach if you want to. You'll be able to do research if you want to. Um, or you can collaborate uh, with uh, members of the team or more. You know, if you have a particular interest, we will entertain it as an idea for you to do as part of your position. So very diverse, very uh, concentrated for learning, uh, very um, intense at times because you're juggling a lot of balls and you're a new grad and you're trying to figure it out, yet you're being kind of thrown to the wolves a little bit. But ultimately, it is a, a wildly rewarding process, which guarantees growth because of the, the diversity of experiences that you're exposed to. See if I, perfect. So this is essentially what mentorship looks like. So you will get mentorship, you know, by doing. You will get mentorship by meeting one on one with people who are, you know, great at what they do both physios, athletic therapists, sport, phys uh, sport physicians, basically anybody who you feel you could benefit from learning from, we will make happen. Uh, you will participate in collaborative rounds, both within HBC and our parent company being EPA um, and shadowing. And so uh, you will learn one of a thousand different ways, whether it be uh, field side, or uh, you know, being having your hand held and kind of walk through a case study uh, or by shadowing uh, somebody you look up to. So here it is, you know, again, when we talk about clinics or universities or otherwise that have pre-established connections, these are some of the connections that we have. And this is by no means a, an exhaustive list of that. So as you can see, HBC is the exclusive sport medicine clinic for the Guelph Griffins. And so therefore we are, uh, you know, neck and neck, you know, arm in arm uh, involved with the athletics department. And that is by far the coolest part of working at the HBC. We also have a ton of collaborations on the academic side. A lot of research happens out of HBC. Uh, HBC helps to recruit for research. Uh, you know, uh, members of the team will teach in, in these departments. Uh, 
faculty will reach out to the HPC looking to collaborate, uh, you know, monthly. And so lots of diversity to get involved with the university as a whole. From a community standpoint, we work with Guelph Soccer. There's a, a citywide event with 20,000 athletes called the Guelph Games coming up this summer that we're going to be the uh, clinic for. Uh, I teach at University of Guelph Humber, and so there's opportunity to collaborate both within the University of Guelph and the University of Guelph Humber, part of their kinesiology program, uh, the human anatomy. So we as a clinic will yearly go to the anatomy lab and uh, essentially learn from the anatomists within that team. Plus, as a fellow, um, you have access to that uh, lab by whether it be through myself or uh, through one of my colleagues who teach in the anatomy lab. And they are more than you know grateful for the clinical perspective that uh, uh, us at the HBC provide their students. Uh, it kind of brings the anatomy to life, which they really appreciate. One of our sister clinics is Conestoga College, and so uh, we also work within uh, their athletics department. Not so much HBC because we're focused on the Guelph, but Aramosa Physio Associates uh, has a, a clinic within uh, Conestoga, and uh, otherwise uh, we'll work with their athletes as well. And then you can see lots of other community sports, both past and present, that uh, we will work with as well, whether it be doing baseline testing, uh, supporting them through tournaments, or otherwise, uh, the list is quite endless. So I want you to apply. Um, how competitive it is, is purely dependent on how many people apply. But this year, this coming year, we are hiring for two or more positions. And so while I hope we get a barrage of applications, we also have more uh, positions than ever to be able to service that barrage of applications. And so how you will apply is by um, connecting with myself, sending uh, a resume, uh, follow up with me as well, and I will give you more details as to um, what that looks like, but uh, connect whether it be on LinkedIn or by email, and I would love to chat with you, learn more about what background you come from, what your career goal is, and see how I can facilitate that. Even if you don't have intentions of applying to the sport fellowship, um, you know, I can help you get a job elsewhere as well um, through EPA or otherwise, and, uh, you know, I'm curious to hear uh, what you have to say and what your kind of career goals are. So what the requirements are is a provisional license uh, initially, which then, you know, transition into uh, registration. And so we, you know, for this are welcome new grads to apply. Um, you know, once you start practicing, you will have liability insurance. So that is nothing, you know, different than outside clinics that you would see. Uh, membership within orthopedic and sport is preferred. Uh, again, that is free or discounted as a new grad, so that's not a biggie. And then that sport first responder, that way you have the initial skill set to be able to uh, help an athlete in need, as well as then you can uh, partake and uh, partake in the SPC curriculum should you want to formalize your credential. Then you'd be hired, and then we would work together quite a bit. Uh, and I would look forward to that more than anything. So questions, another obnoxious uh, video graphic that I think is frozen because it's probably tired of my BS. So. Jason, did I answer your question? In the meantime, I will answer Joshua's. Uh, what level of postgrad education training would someone need to just work weekends on some or just work events or on some weekends or to just dabble in sport? Would it be sport first responder or otherwise? Uh, so it depends on the level that you uh, want to work. If you want to work with, uh, you know, an eight year old uh, baseball team, you probably don't need anything. You probably need CPR and first aid, and otherwise they will see you as being a physio as being overqualified. If you want to work with the Olympics, you probably need your sport diploma and you know 15 years of experience before then. And so depends on the level, depends on how desperate they are. 
uh, depends on if it's a paid opportunity or volunteer opportunity. All of, all of those will you know determine how much uh, training you would need. At minimum, I would say you should have support first responder. That way, if something were to happen, you would feel at least somewhat you know prepared to deal with it. Uh, and if you wanted to work with anything beyond a high school level, then you probably should have, uh, you know, a bit more training, whether it be SBC or a fellowship or, you know, mentorship with a sport physio or something that can help to supplement that. Joshua, I hope that helped. You let me know. What other questions do we have? Anything else? This is your time to uh, to pick my brain. Um, certainly outside of that, you know, we can chat uh, via phone call or uh, Teams meeting. Um, but I hope that, you know, today provides a little bit of perspective into the fellowship, you know, as one way to learn. I hope it provides insight into sport physio is fantastic but perhaps not as glamorous as it seems, but that's okay because sport physio is still so friggin' fantastic, um, as well as how to formalize uh, and recognize your skill set through the SBC process. And so I welcome, you know, however many people are on this call, I hope every single one of you apply for the, the fellowship. Um, and, uh, you know, in a perfect world, I would work with every single one of you. And, uh, you know, I, I, or at the very least, you leave today feeling like uh, you want to and could work within sport and contribute to the success of uh, any given athlete or any given team. So I will let all of that marinate and I will leave you to go home and sleep or watch the Raptors game or whatever is on right now. And otherwise, look forward to everybody connecting in the very near future. You should see a job posting for SBC come up in the sooner than later, which will have a formal deadline. But if you wanted to connect long before you, you saw that, uh, I would more than welcome it. And I would love the opportunity to chat with you about, you know, what life at Guelph looks like. But even outside of that, you know, what life as a, a sport physio uh, entails, even if you don't have any intentions of applying. So I uh, thank you all for time and attention. I love talking about this stuff more than you know. And so I, I appreciate the forum to which to uh, communicate. So uh, thank you. And otherwise, have yourself a fantastic night and uh, hope to talk to a lot of you soon. Perfect. All right. See everybody. I appreciate it. And uh, reach out should you have any questions. I uh, I look forward to connecting. See ya.